In the previous video, I offered some criticisms of McCloskey's 1983 article, The Rhetoric of Economics. But I don't think any of those criticisms that I made are fatal to the project that is implicit in that article and has been expanded on by McCloskey yourself and by some others as well. Uh, rather, I think those criticisms uh, really suggest that there are ways in which the overall project about rhetoric can be um, improved. Implicitly, I think that they suggest that. Uh, that there are ways of perhaps and that would require some effort, ways of resolving what I think are tensions and uh, contradictions within it. Um, now I just want to talk about what I think is uh, important in the article, in very general terms. That is, I don't want to look at very particular arguments in the article. There's too many of those to go through, but rather some general themes that I think are, uh, are very important and uh, worthy of being kept foremost in mind. One is, obviously, the very notion that rhetoric is uh, central to the conduct of any academic discipline, including economics, and, and with it outside the academy as well, for that matter. Um, and here, when we talk about rhetoric, we don't mean ornamental language or tricky language designed to deceive, but rather we mean it in the classical sense or in the modern version of the classical sense, in, um, in which we're talking about the discursive act of persuasion which has, in the classical form anyway, has three elements to it, logos, ethos, and pathos. And uh, when we analyze a piece of work, we should really pay attention to the logos. We should pay attention to the reasoned dialectic that's going on, that's endeavoring to discover truth. Um, and we should judge an article on whether it is living up to the notion of reason dialectic with an aim to truth. It doesn't necessarily mean you literally you discover it once and for all, but it's it's um, it's an imperative, so to speak. Uh, you should always be looking for okay. So this is a claim that's been made or a conclusion that's been drawn. What are the warrants for that? We should examine those warrants that are offered. We should examine the form of an argument that's made, its warrants with its connected to its conclusions. We should look at the um, different kinds of arguments which can legitimately be made, the kinds the forms. We can it's legitimate to have deductive arguments, of course inductive arguments, abductive arguments, analogical arguments, which includes metaphor and simile as well. And uh, we should bear in mind that, um, of course, the arguments that are being made aren't necessarily going to establish once and for all the truth of the matter. The Logos is reasoned dialectic. It's an ongoing back and forth between interlocutors, ultimately, which implies that there's never a kind of final knockdown blow. There's always a chance for a response, uh, for an improvement on what has been said before. Uh, but that involves critical engagement. It can't be just a case of accepting conventions, for example. And then there's ethos or ethos, where um, a rhetor will attempt to 
establish the trustworthiness of what they're saying. And we do need to rely on that. We do need to rely on trustworthiness because we know there are always going to be epistemic gaps. That is, we know that it's always the case that uh, in, well, almost always the case, that the conclusion is not guaranteed by the premises, by the warrants that are offered. There's room for doubt. And one leaps, so to speak, makes that leap of faith, so to speak, if one trusts the, uh, the person who is making the case, or one trusts the warrants that are being offered that they're strong and that they're, they're accurate. Um, and then there's pathos. So this is the cultivating of, I'm going to call this the cultivating of sentiment. So uh, it's a case of motivating the reader or motivating the listener to care about what you're saying. It's all very well to say something's true, but if no one cares, it doesn't have any effect that in the world. It doesn't move people to action. And almost all rhetoric is about that. I mean, if you're doing, if you're saying anything in the world and to anyone, and you have, it's no part of your intention that it has any effect on anything whatsoever, then one might ask, why are you saying this, or why are you writing this? Um, so, pathos is the devices which make people care, uh, which make people, which encourage people to see the worth in what's being argued for. Uh, and there's various methods in, by which that can be done, but chief amongst them is, is usually an appeal to the pre-existing beliefs or values, I should say, of the um, of the reader or the listener. All right. So when we engage in analysis, this is vital when we're reading a piece of work. But what's equally important and often overlooked, I think, is that it's not, especially when analysis is being conducted, when we pull apart an article. Uh, is the synthesis of them, that is, how they are woven together to make for a compelling case. In a sense, uh, the weaving together of logos, ethos, and pathos is uh, how well it's woven together uh, is a key ingredient in itself. There's the whole is greater than the part, so to speak, in its uh, psychological effect, or it's, it, in its uh, how compelling it becomes. An example of that uh, might be um, Antony's argument against Brutus in William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. If we were to just say, well, all we're really interested in is Logos as scientists. Right? We're interested in the argument, the form of the argument, and whether the premises validly uh, lead to the conclusion. Um, if we were to extract just the argument itself, the, just the Logos from Antony's speech, then it's easy to understand. However, it's not really compelling in the same way it is when it's woven together with the other aspects of rhetoric. Uh, so Antony's argument is, in essence, um, all assassins, how would it go? All assassins of generous rulers are traitors. Brutus assassinated a generous ruler. Therefore, Brutus is a traitor. That's the argument that 
Anthony makes. It's bare bones form. That's the, the logos of it. But when we see the actual argument that's made by Antony, you realise that it's this weaving together of these other elements, which makes it a far more compelling case. And also, incidentally, it doesn't have this... This argument that I just stated isn't explicitly made. It's made in a very roundabout way. But nonetheless, it's an extremely compelling roundabout way. Uh, let's have a look at it. He says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. To a Brutus! There's been no harm of Brutus here! This Caesar was a tyrant! That's certain! We have blessed that Rome is rid of him! You gentle Roman. Peace! Let us hear him! Friends! Romans! Countrymen! Lend me your ears! I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. Uh, the good is often terrid with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously had Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, Aye. so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper call, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had a great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words. He would not take the crown. Therefore, he certainly was not ambitious. There is not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I'd rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I would wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. 
Yea, beggar hell of him for memory, and dying mention it within their will. The world, the world, the world, the world. I must not read it. It is not meat you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? No, we 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 will you stay a while? I have always shot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors. Barbarous. You will compel me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come down. Stand far off. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the nervi. Look. In this place ran Cassius Dagger through. Oh, see what a rent the envious Casca made. Through here, the well beloved Brutus stabbed. <laughs> and as he plucked his cursed steel away, Marco, the blood of Caesar, followed it. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh ye gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. For oh, this was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. And I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Kind soul. What? Weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded. Look you here! Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors. A oh, piteous spectacle. Oh, noble Caesar! Traitors! Oh, most noble Caesar! Good friends! Sweet friends! Let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny! They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that loved my friend. And that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar's that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny! Oh, oh, Yet hear me, countrymen! Yet hear me speak! Why, friends, you go to do you know not what? Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. The will. The will. The will. The will. The will. Here is the will. And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. Moreover, 
He hath left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar! When comes such another? So, in watching that, I hope you were able to identify the elements of classical rhetoric there, the logos, the pathos, and the ethos, um, and see how they're woven together in a very compelling manner. Uh, I think this, in a sense, is one of the general things that McCloskey is getting at, uh, that uh, if we were more aware of the rhetoric which we already utilize, we can better understand arguments that are made, and we can better utilize them in more convincing, compelling ways to generate superior forms of argumentation superior forms of rhetoric than are currently employed. What else do I agree with? I think another general theme in McCloskey's work, and I don't think that this is um, really entirely explicit. There are mentions of it, I think, in the article. But I think it's a very important theme, and that is there's a kind of underlying moralism um, against not the barbarians at the gates, but rather the barbarians in residence within a discipline. So, uh, what I mean by that is that what McCloskey, I think, is pointing out or pointing to is a very important point about hypocrisy and injustice in the disciplinary discourse within um, economics, as specifically as it relates to methodology. The hypocrisy comes, according to Mikulski, and I think there's, there's a good deal of truth to this, uh, when economists lay claim to a high status, uh, lay claim to being the queen of the social sciences, being superior to all of the other social sciences, by virtue of its rigorous deployment of the scientific method. Uh, that's the kind of official rhetoric that's utilised. But they don't actually follow that method, as McCloskey argues, because no one can. Uh, no science follows the scientific method, which is a cartoon version from uh, first year textbooks or high school textbooks, or is sometimes put forward by popularizers of science, um, you know, or public intellectuals who advocate science. It's a very kind of cartoonish version that they usually have which economists often appeal to themselves, but don't apply. It's hypocritical in that respect. The injustice comes um, in the deployment of that hypocrisy. So, in reality, the traditional methodological claims that are made are not really rules of conduct for investigation rather serve very often as rhetorical weapons, and here I mean rhetorical in the, in the bad sense, right? in the deceptive sense. Uh, they're weapons that are used very often to shut down criticism and debate rather than achieve the opposite. So, for example, you could have someone say, um, X doesn't follow the scientific method, therefore X, X's work is unscientific, and therefore X is not entitled to a hearing within the discipline. Or at least 
they can be safely ignored. So this is doing injustice because the premise upon which one um, removes the right to speech or uh, is grounds for ignoring work is spurious in itself. Uh, it's just a device of speech uh, that has that is not literally applied by the very people themselves. If we were to be consistent and just, then everyone, including the people who make this claim, should be ruled out of the discipline. There would be no one left. So I think McCloskey is pointing this out in a way that uh, traditional economic methodology is a weapon of exclusion and it's a weapon of dogmatism that closes down thinking within the discipline. On the issue of dogmatism, I think McCloskey's, uh, one of the points that McCloskey's making in a, in a sense is that there are certain notions, not in a sense, she's making these points, uh, that notions such as knowledge, theory, evidence, uh, can become uh, uncritically accepted conventions uh, rather than thought about critically and self-reflectively. I mean, what, do we, what are we really doing here? What do I really know? Is, does this really count as theory? Or what else could count as theory? Is this good evidence? No, what do I mean by good evidence, really? Um, if certain these if certain concepts kind of become they become atrophied, they become a kind of dull convention that's uncritically accepted. Then serious thinking about what is reasonable, what is necessary, what is useful for investigating the world tends to fall away. Um, so, for example, you find, sometimes find that, um, and it's not necessarily in official discourse, but it might be in unofficial discourse, that is, in the, in the conference room or in the corridor or something like that, or just in, you know, as a kind of preconception in people's minds that comes out in conversation, that, uh, say, a theory just is, it's nothing more than, and nothing less than, a set of mathematical propositions with economic labels attached. Or a theory doesn't count as true unless there are mathematical proofs of its theorems. Or um, if P is greater than 0.05, in an empirical study, an econometric study, then its findings are worthless. Maybe that's not necessarily true. Uh, if the p-value is less than 0.05, then its results are valuable. They're worthwhile. Maybe that's not necessarily true either. Um, if a sample is very small, then the empirical findings that come out of that are entirely worthless. Maybe that's not necessarily true. I know I myself have thought precisely that. Uh, and it, but when you start reflecting on it, well, it kind of depends what's the purpose of the empirical study. Is it attempting to make generalizations about the population as a whole? Maybe it's not. You need to look carefully at it. Maybe you might say, well, that's a very small sample. But this is just one study. We could, there might be a, a, a gazillion studies out there with very small samples. Maybe a meta-analysis of all of these, all of these uh, studies might enable us to say something fruitful. Who knows? We need to think about that 
rather than just accept as a convention. Ah, p-value greater than 0.05, rubbish, not interested. Right? This is, uh, you know, dogmatic, simple-minded thinking of, of uh, a mechanical, robotic kind, rather than a fully functioning, critically thinking human being. And I think that that's what economists uh, should aspire to, be thinking human beings. There's no machine that can make scientific decisions. Every science is about persuading other scientists about the truth of the matter. Plate tectonics, the idea that the continents move, took a long time to become persuasive in geology. It took a half a century. Um, and there are no rules for deciding whether an argument is humanly persuasive or not. It's humanly persuasive or it's not. Um, we, we have this problem in economics that we're not very philosophically sophisticated. So we don't know that it's long been a finding of the philosophy of science that there's no such thing as scientific methodology. Economists are still back in their high school chemistry course many years ago where the, where the, where the teacher told them that there was a scientific method and here's what it is. There, there are no, there's no machine you can stick numbers into and out comes a scientific conclusion. You have to decide, look, I can think of a zillion examples of this. Let's take one from the great Robert Fogel and Stanley Angerman, their book on American slavery, where they discovered from looking at plantation records that people were whipped only two times a year. I think, it, am I correct? I think it's two or some, some Okay, six tenths of a time per year. Let's go with six tenths of a time per year. And you can say, well, that settles that question. Time out. <laughs> Suppose you were whipped six tenths of a time per year. Suppose the president of the University of Michigan, I actually know her, she was once the president of Iowa, um, brings out her whip and whips the faculty and students and staff six tenths of a time per year for malfeasance. Come on, you have to make a separate judgment. And Bob and Stan understood this perfectly well. You have to make a separate judgment about how many whippings are significant. And I happen to think that in a free society, any whippings are significant. One tenth of a whipping per year is, is significant. So truth is not in the numbers uninterpreted. If it's a nice day out in Ann Arbor, it's 70 degrees. Not this time of year, but say in spring, late spring, 70 degrees, a nice day. Well, that's right. In the context of ordinary human interaction on the earth in this era, 70 degrees is a nice day. But by the standard of the surface of the sun, it's extremely cold. By the standard of interstellar space, it's extremely hot. You gotta have a human judgment of what it is you're interested in. And interest is a human matter. Interest, what's interesting is what's interesting to human scientists, not what's in the numbers. The numbers are inputs, but they're not outputs. Another theme, related theme, is McCloskey's um, general conception about what economic methodology should be. So here she doesn't offer some kind of fully fledged alternative methodology, which I think is probably a good thing in a way, because if you want open critical engagement uh, between 
dynamic thinking individuals and groups, then you don't want them to be artificially constrained by conventions that are um, that are not thought about seriously. So, and that's one of the problems that she's arguing is the sometimes the case in traditional economic methodology. It, for maybe not for methodologists themselves, but for economists, they kind of become conventions that are just uncritically accepted. So her alternative is very simple and somewhat moralistic. Okay, so uh, and that is just be honest, be clear, and be tolerant in attending to the arguments of your interlocutors, and be honest, clear, and tolerant in attempting to persuade others of your own position. You know, you behave like a decent human being, basically. That's her version of, of methodology. That's all there really is to it. Um, in a sense, you don't really need to talk about whether you're being scientific or not. That becomes really a, a sideshow. It's, a, it's, an, it's an unimportant issue, the, the label that you attach to it. The question is, are you being honest, clear, fair, tolerant? That's all that's required. Now, that's obviously kind of like a motherhood statement in a way, and little more than that, but it's a motherhood statement that's worth stating because, as the bard once said, it's more honoured in the breach than the observance. So it's worth reminding ourselves that these are kinds of ideals to which we might aspire. I think there's something that's fine, it's a nice thing to say, and, and people should be reminded of it. She also goes on to say that uh, the proper business of economic methodology, insofar as there is any proper business, uh, is an anarchistic one. Uh, resisting the rigidity and the pretensions of rules. So the methodologist should be doing, in a sense, the opposite of what the traditional methodologist does. That is, attempts to figure out what the rules of scientific conduct should be and attempting to enforce that. Rather, it, it's the opposite. What they should be doing is trying to blast apart rules uh, and conventions which shackle people's minds. Uh, and they should be delegitimizing the rules. That is, they should be saying, it's okay. You can break these rules. Right? They're not founded on anything anyway. Break them. See what happens. See where you can go with it. Right? Be adventurous. Uh, don't uncritically accept conventions. That's what the role of the economic methodologist should be. Methodologists should be champions of and protectors of experimentation in economics. I don't mean doing experiments. I mean experimentation in thought and in methods, in techniques, uh, in looking for new sources of, uh, of information, uh, protecting invention, theoretical invention, uh, and innovation in the field. And therefore, I think, being champions and protectors of pluralism, that is, allowing the thousand flowers to bloom, but that means protecting the flowers, allowing them to bloom. Not letting a particular weed take over the entire garden. Um, because this is a condition for those other things. It's a condition for experimentation, ex uh, innovation, uh, invention uh, within the discipline. So I think these are extremely valuable lessons, general lessons that come out of McCloskey's work, and um, that's why I would commend the article to you.
Also because it's just a fun read. It's just enjoyable to read. Okay?